Hi folks, so here at last is the second instalment of the SketchUp training series that I began. I had a lot of good feedback on the first one. If you didn't catch that, go check out my channel, look for this video, Getting Started with SketchUp for Fitted Furniture Makers. It's meant to be British focused, millimeter based, and I'm trying to fast track you to do the sort of drawings you need to do to fit furniture. But it'll be relevant to general cabinet making and that sort of thing as well. So in the first video, we, we uh, learnt the, the basic tools to build something like this. What I want to do today is show you um, how to create something based on this project, which we recently designed and installed. So you may have seen it if you follow me on social media. This was the finished job and this was the drawing. So it was built exactly as per the drawing. Now we're going to cover quite a lot of things today, so what I suggest you do is watch it through and then after that have it going on a separate device next to your computer so you can pause and practice the things that I suggest. We're going to touch on groups versus components. Um, we're going to talk about different ways of scaling and resizing things, pros and cons of different methods, how to add dimensions and scenes and layers, which I've used to help me prepare these different viewpoints for customers. And a couple of other things, we'll see how much we can pack in. Just before I dive into that, there's an important correction I need to make from the previous video. I was talking about an expensive piece of software that I tried using before sticking with SketchUp, and I was talking about cabinet vision, but I accidentally said cabinet sense. Cabinet Vision is this one, costs thousands of pounds, very, very good, but it was a stretch too far for me, in my business. Um, Cabinet Sense is an extension, like a plugin, for SketchUp that I do use and that enables me to automate the way we draw and to output things as cutting lists. So to cover a question that I had, what I pay for how we run SketchUp is the $50 per month level for Cabinet Sense, which gives us some CNC output functionality. I am paying for SketchUp Pro, which is $300 a year. And I'm also, well, I have paid a one-off payment for the gold edition of Cutlist Plus, which is what Cabinet Sense outputs into and gives you quite a lot of control over the cutting list. Okay, so having cleared that up, let's move on to creating a drawing like this. Now this starts with a sketch. So I go to see the customer, talk through what they want, and then I, I do a sketch very much like this. And this is my usual format. I draw at the bottom of the page the plan with dimensions marked on, and roughly in line with that, I draw the elevation. That's as much as I need to then reproduce it in SketchUp. So I'm going to be working in SketchUp Make. I'll start a new project. I like to have a floor plan, so I've just selected the rectangle. Draw on that. I'm going to group that so things don't stick to it. And uh, I'm just going to make the face style, so that's under view and face style, hidden line. So that gets rid of the shading, it's just like a line drawing. That's how I do most of the things I present to customers. So referring back and forth to the, um, the sketch, we've got our first alco width of 1070. So I'm gonna get the line tool, click on it there, or just hit L for line. See how it's referencing off the, the y-axis, which is green. So I've clicked, I've moved it, I've clicked again. Same again, it's still active. Now having set my direction on the red axis, or the x-axis, I'm gonna type in 1070. So, same process.
What I then do is, again, making sure it's on the green axis, I draw at a fairly arbitrary distance beyond it, and then join it up, and that has created a surface. So now P for push-pull, click, release, and then the operation is active, and I can just type in 2700, enter. Yes, that was the correct height. Now there are different ways of adding in the skirting and stuff, and you may choose not to do that at all, but I find it's helpful just to get a reference for the heights of things. If you look at my original drawing, I did draw in an extruded skirting. I'm just going to save a bit of time and not show you that today, but may do that another time. The other method is just getting a an indication of heights. So I'm selecting these lines at the bottom, so I haven't grouped everything yet. I'm selecting by holding down shift whilst using the pointer tool. And just to remind you, you can get to the pointer tool by hitting spacebar if you're ever on a different tool. I'm orbiting and panning as I work um, by using keystrokes and the roller wheel on the mouse. So remember, press the roller wheel on the mouse and that's your orbit tool. Okay, so I've selected the, um, the lines at the bottom. I'm going to use the move tool. And we had a nine inch skirting. Now I am working in millimeters in this model, but SketchUp's quite clever in that you can tell it things in inches if that's just quicker for you. So click on a reference point. Um, before or after clicking, you can just hit Alt. I think it might be Control on the PC, and that makes it a copy procedure rather than a move. And now with that operation active, I'm typing nine, and then I'm typing the inches symbol. Because if I don't put a symbol in, it just assumes it's millimeters. Hit enter. Now this occasionally happens. Try that again. If that's happened a couple of times, it doesn't like it. But it should do it, and it did on the second time. So again, just move them up. Now with that still selected, I just want to give an indication of the picture rail because I could take the same lines to do that. So that's at 2055. Now here's another method that I use just for finding out where things should land. Because the selected part is off the floor, but I've got a measurement from the floor, I'm going to take the tape measure, which is keystroke T, and using this doesn't deselect what you've already got selected. So I'm going to reference off the floor. You see I've, just, I've clicked on a line, and what it does is it brings a line parallel from that. So I'm going up that surface, what was that height? 2055. Enter. Back to M for move. Alt for copy move. Snap that at that intersection point. And do the same again. Just move it up. It's about 50 mil. Now I'm going to give myself an indication again of the cornice, but I'm not too worried about exactly where that is. Now I'm not going to take the time to draw the windows and the radiator, but you can imagine how that could be done off the drawings, because I do usually note down those sorts of things, particularly anything that's near to the alcove and might impinge on it. So back to our version of the drawing. You may notice this still looks a little bit different. The lines are thinner. So let's have a look at style. So under window, Really a styles palette. I think they're also called trays sometimes. Styles tray. So there's lots you can do here. I'm not going to cover all of it by any means, except to say that when you go to edit, so, so backtracking a bit, select gives you lots of pre-made styles, which display things in a very different way. But um, if we just go to what it was. Um, so edit, so I've lost what it was, haven't I? So what I'm trying to say is edit and profiles. Profiles thickens the edges. I've just got to go back here and make it hidden line because that's what I wanted. Loads of options here, you can get a bit lost in it. This is just my preferred line drawing style without the shading, etc. So what, what I'm going to do is just update. So when you see these, these circular arrows, that's an update symbol. So the style now has been updated. And I'm also going to create a scene. So a scene is the camera angle. 
so how you're looking at the thing, combined with other settings such as the style setting that I've just created. So whatever you see now on screen, if you think, right, I want to, I want to see it that way again, if you go to plus, what you're seeing right now gets saved. So right click and rename scene. I'll just do it down here actually. Let's call that perspective. That appears at the top here. That's a button at the top. So if you've been drawing and sort of spinning around, you want to just quickly get back to that viewpoint. You click on it and there it is. Okay, let's get drawing. Let's just assume that this is pretty much the space as is. And I'm perhaps now sitting with a customer and we're discussing what they want. And we say, well, let's have a, let's just have a go at putting two base cabinets um, and see how it looks. Before I draw something into it, I want to select all of that and group it. So I've triple clicked to select, right click, make group. That means that what I draw now isn't going to interfere with it. So I'm snapping to existing geometry. When I type in the size of this rectangle, I have to type the width and then the height. So I can see the width is 1070. So I'll just, I'll retype that first and then I'm going to make this a cupboard that's 700 high. P for push-pull, let's make it 500 deep. And similar to what you saw me do before, shift and select, M for move, alt for copy move. Let's just give an indication of a countertop, say 25 millimeters thick. And depending on how you build these, you can just move, move lines across again. So I'm going to bring in a strip there, strip here, Now, whenever you've got ungrouped geometry and a line touches another line, it, it breaks it. So you see this now at the bottom is, well, in fact, three lines, which means I can then copy move that one just from the middle by selecting it, moving it up. Let's say that's our plinth. And I can start making this more 3D quite easily by then just push pulling. I'm going to push that in 18. I'm going to pull that out 20. Just gonna put a line there up against the edge and pull that beyond 20. It does sometimes leave little artifacts which if it's on a flat face you can delete without messing with that sort of making anything disappear that shouldn't. And again with your, your inferencing where SketchUp just very cleverly finds what, what you might want to snap to. So it's just snapping to the line, but then here it's found the midpoint. We're working in perspective, so sometimes things don't look like the middle, but they are. And go back up to the, the midpoint at the top, and I'm indicating the doors. Now, here's a tool that I don't think we touched on in the last video. This is the offset tool. You can get to it by pressing F. To be honest, it's one of those tools I, I don't usually think to go to by keystroke. I just go click on it. Don't use it so often. So whatever surface or face you're hovering over, it will act on. So when I act on this one, I'm going to click, release, and then it's in progress. And what it's doing is taking the, the shape that bounds the surface and just offsetting those lines um, wherever you click or wherever you type in. So the precision I'm going to type in, see down at the bottom right, I've typed in 75, hit enter, and I've created a shaker door. Now with a lot of these tools, like offset or push-pull, whatever you did last time, it will do again if you double-click. So I've just double clicked and again I've got 75. So similarly with push pull, let's push that in six millimeters. So type six, hit enter. That was after pushing a little bit in the direction I wanted it to go in. So again over here, I can do the same thing. I'll go in six mil. And if I did it on anything else, it would do the same. And again, six more. Just undoing that with Control Z or Command Z on the Mac. So that's a good indication of a base cabinet. Before I do anything else, I'm going to select that and group it. Now let's look at chunky shelves. Now the way I would typically lay them out is I might have a rough idea of what I think will be a good spacing. Um, and I will use the tape measure. So I've hit T again and I'm clicking on an existing line because I find it helpful then to just drag a parallel line off it. 
let's say that's going to be 400 millimeters off the surface. So R for rectangle, going across to there, it's a 107 O wide alcove, and my shelves usually finish at 54 millimeters thick. <clears throat> Push pull, I'd usually stop them maybe 10 millimeters back from the front edge of the alcove there. Now, whereas I made this into a group, which we've covered before, I'm going to make this one into a component. So triple click to select or bounding box from left to right, right click or control click and make component. You can just go ahead and hit create and ignore all this. You can name it, which has some advantages. So I will just name it as a shelf. Don't worry about the rest here for now. So create. The difference between groups and components really comes into play when you have copies of them. So I've selected both of these with Shift and the Select Tool. M again, I'm sure you're familiar with this now. I'm just going to drag them over here. Well, while I'm at it, why don't, why don't I drag them into position in this wider alcove? I just disappeared, disappeared through the floor there. So. To get back to the last view, I just went to this little thing here. So if you find yourself going inside things, just hit that one, it gets you back. So we've got down here, a group and a copy of that group. And here we've got a component and a copy of that component. If I go and mess with this group, so I've double clicked to, to go inside it. So everything I'm doing now is within the group. Um, anything I do, like say if I wanted to put a cable out there, that was that was a circle tool, I just hit C, C to get to the circle tool. Um, <clears throat> right, let me just push that through. It's only done it to that one, because when I copied this, it's just another group that stands alone. When you copy a component, anything you do to it, to mess with it, will affect all of the other components that you've copied. Which is a really helpful feature because once we've got a whole bunch of shelves here, if we want to make a change to the standard thickness or something, you only need to change one and they'll all change. So to show you that, let me just copy a few more. Um, I'm matching as I remember it, the original, the original drawing. Come to think of it, no, that's not quite right, but it doesn't matter much. Um, so, copy move. Here's another helpful thing. I'll just move that. Copy, copy move that once, but then before doing anything else or clicking anywhere else, I'm going to do X like times three. See that appears in the box at the bottom right, and I've repeated those shelves times three. Yeah, this isn't quite how I built it because I didn't have it hitting the picture rail. So those spaces actually were 200 mil, not 250. So we've got a load of copies of the same component. So now if the customer says, actually, I really just want those to be thinner, I can, I can change them to be thinner and they can see how everything looks. So what do you do then if you're using components, but you do want them to change. So over here, these want, these want to be longer. The thing with a component is you can actually stretch it. So anything that you do sort of outside of the wrapper before double clicking will distort what's inside. So you can scale that and it doesn't change the rest. If, however, you went inside it and push pulled it, which is another way of doing it, it would change the rest. I'm making those longer, but I'm actually also making those ones on the left longer. I'm just going to undo a few times because I do actually want these to stay at the, the standard thickness. <clears throat> Yeah, so we copy these across. We can select the whole lot and scale them. 
I'm not sure if I said actually. So scale is the tool over here. And you can hit keystroke S to get to it. So you can either do that on one item. So S and you've got these grab handles. It's very rare that I use anything except these sort of front and back or side to side ones because the other ones tend to distort. So you can scale scale it that way. You notice down the bottom right, there's a scaling proportion. So if you put two in there, it will be twice as long. <clears throat> Quite a helpful feature is you can also type in the length you want it to end up at as long as you put the units in. So if you put 30, 16 millimeters, it ends up at that length. <clears throat> So these are still these are still linked to the ones on the left. So by scaling it um, and not push pulling it, I've kept them linked. And if I wanted to change the thickness, they would all change. If I wanted them to become unique, I can click on one of them, right click and go to make unique. That'll then mean that the change doesn't work on that particular one. You can also select a few and make them all unique. And what that will mean is that they will be linked to each other, but they won't anymore be linked to the other ones in the model. So the change I make over here now doesn't affect them, but if I change one of them, it affects them. I hope that makes sense. The difference compared to a group is um, groups are just fully independent. So I've, I've taken this base cabinet, I've copied it over here. Let's say I want to flip it. There's two ways I could do that before I resize it. You see I've got this notch on the one side, I want it to be on the left. I can either go to S for scale again, grab that handle, you can't see it there, but you can sort of find where it is and then there it is. Scale and start moving in the right direction and then just hit minus one. But that would work even if you didn't move in the right direction. I'm going to just undo that, Control Z or Command Z, to show you the other way of doing that, which is you can right click, go to flip along, and groups red. So the red axis is the axis that's running like this. So flipping along it, flipped it the way I wanted. Now I'm just going to move that with the help of a guide to where it needs to be. Now we looked at the scaling things. If you scale something like this that has a lot of detail in it, what you're going to do is distort it. So I can scale it to be the width of the alcove. But what I've done is I've then I've opened up a gap here because this has scaled bigger. And I've made these door styles wider than I want them to be. So we can use a tape measure to check that, which is another use of the tape measure. Click on an edge, click or just hover over another edge, and it reads out the width. So that's that, that little squiggly line in front of the, the measurement there means it's not actually quite precisely what it shows. Um, it might be 95.043 or something like that, because it's just been scaled. So that sort of limitation is what led to us developing pre-drawn components with increasing levels of complexity and using things like cabinet sense to cleverly and dynamically scale things. I'm not going to go too much into that right now because we haven't got time. Um, just briefly, if you were doing something like this, the way you might choose to do it is to click in, select the geometry you want to move, find a reference point, drag that over, then you haven't distorted anything. And then there's a couple of different ways you might want to then refine the center because these lines are broken, you can't just reference off the center like I did when I first drew it, but I can just drop in, see I've just clicked and left it in the same place, a guideline there. And then I'm gonna find the center by moving that guideline with copy move, so Alt and move to here, to that other one. Release and then divide by two. So I've copy move something, I've hit divide by two, so it puts another copy of that thing there. I can select all of this geometry in the middle, reference off this, which I want to end up on the dotted line, and snap it to the dotted line. 
So you can get quite quick at, at doing that. Of course, everything we're doing here is just presentation. There's nothing inside this. Um, there's no image shelf or anything like that. But it's, it's a pretty good, fairly quickly produced presentation drawing. Well, time's ticking on, so I want to also show you something about dimensions and uh, a little bit more about how you can use scenes and layers to control what you see and what you show the customer. <clears throat> so we've already created this perspective view. We do have a load of guidelines that are no longer needed, so you can go to edit and delete guides. What's helpful for the customer to see is the heights and spacings of the shelves. So let me show you a very helpful tool for um, getting those spacings just right, because the last thing you want is to fit a load of shelves at considerable expense, and then the customer says, oh, my books don't fit. So what I always do is I, I discuss with the customer what they want to put on the shelves. So in this particular case, they had a lot of paperbacks, which meant the shelves were closer together than, than than I usually do them really. Um, and we were able to check what would fit with these pre-drawn books. So this is something that we as a team at Freebird have, have come up with. We've measured all these different things. So like you've got your paper back here and uh, we've labeled them and it is such a time saver. So I've dropped that in, that's a component. I'm about to show you how to get hold of that and use that yourself. So it's a component which I'm gonna explode so I can get out the things within it. Um, when you drop it in, its, it's insert point is at the rear, so you can just drop it to the rear of the shelf and straight away you can see how far forward things come. So I'm going to copy referencing the rear. And this is what I've done with the customer, just to confirm what would fit on the shelf. So like there's a, a DVD case. So having satisfied ourselves of that, um, I would normally create a, a new scene as an elevation. So um, we'll get a parallel projection. So your parallel projection on the camera, standard views front, zoom in a bit, move it to where I want it to be. And then let's create, um, yeah, there we go, add. So right click on the scene at the top, go to add to create a new one. Right click on that new one and we'll call that elevation. Now I'm going to add dimensions because once I've done all this, I have a few different views that fully describe the model and I can just drop all that in an email, give the customer the price and leave it with them. And that's one, one less thing off my to-do list when I get back to the office. Now for customers, they don't really need that level of precision. It's a bit more user-friendly to make it in centimeters. So go up to window, model info, units at the bottom here, precision zero and centimeters. And once I click out of that, they automatically update. So that's the sort of view I might want on elevation. Um, but I probably don't want it on perspective. So this is where layers come in handy. Layers are really a way of separating geometry visually, controlling what you see. So you can see with all these books and things, just since dropping that in, the new layers appeared because that layer was embedded in them. Um, as I said, I'll show you how to get hold of these and I hope they'll be useful to you. So I can turn them on and off in the layers palette here. So that was window, layers, and under visible, the checkbox shows whether or not you can see it. I'm gonna create a layer called dimensions. What I wanna do is select all those dimensions, put them on that layer, and I can tr control where I wanna see them. So I've done shift and select to select them. There is a shortcut, which would be window, uh, model info, Something not, not a lot of people know, I think, actually. Go to dimensions, it's quite hidden away. You don't expect to find it here, but there's select all dimensions. So that can be helpful if you've got loads of dimensions you want to select. So still selected. I've created my layer. I'm going to right-click or control-click on the selection. 
entity info. So this tells you about whatever is currently selected. Little drop down box there. And there it is, dimensions. Put them on the dimensions layer. And now I can control whether or not they're seen. What I want to do is have them not visible on this perspective, perspective um, scene. So having made them invisible, I'm going to update that because whatever you currently see, and if you hit update, that's what will stick to that scene. So now because they were previously visible on elevation, there they are, go back to perspective and they're hidden. And so that's how I, I produce these, these various different views. I'd do a couple more for the customer just so all bases are covered and they've signed off the drawings with nothing, nothing becoming a surprise later. Okay, so let me just quickly show you how to get hold of those books. If you go to my Buy Me A Coffee page, buymeacoffee.com slash freebird, this is what you'll see. This is where people go to um, just support me, help me to keep producing stuff for YouTube. So thank you very much to these folks that have recently bought me a coffee. Very much appreciate it. What you can do if you want a little bit more is just buy me a coffee and get hold of all these books. So the way it works is click on get, get access here. This is what you'll see. And it's as simple as this, put in your email address. Click get access. You can pay with PayPal, or if you don't want to be logging in or anything, you can just pay, it's using Stripe. Just put all your details in. Um, they're not kept hold of or anything, you just make the payment. Once you put them in, click pay three pounds and you'll get a link to download um, that SketchUp model. To put it then into your model, what you'll have to do is bring up your components window. So it's Windows, sorry, under Window Components, that's selected, here it is. You go to this little button here, open a local collection, and then find it in your file system. Find the folder that it's within, because what, what this does, it, it wants to open the folder, because you'll think, well, why is that gray? But if you're in the right folder, it'll open the folder, and then you will see it. And all you do is you click on it there, there you have it. You can, you can orbit or pan whilst you're deciding where to put it, and the insert point will be at the back of your shelf. Straight away, you've got an excellent visual guide <clears throat> visual guide to the height of things and as I showed you before you might just want to explode that and then grab grab certain things just to check how they fit one final thing hidden feature in there these are dynamic components there's a little taste of you about dynamic components you may not see the attributes thing down here that was that was just a right click again um, if you're running the free sketchup make and your pro with pro trials expired you might not get some of these options but you should be able to see component options that'll bring up this dialog box and the way we've designed this so me and graham have worked on these um, for the type of object like large book what it says here which you can't edit is the standard setting which we found is a pretty good pretty average large book but you might have a customer with a bunch of books of a particular size maybe they've got an encyclopedia and they're a different dimension, you can just type that in. Maybe they're taller, and you want to check whether they're going to fit. Once you've got that drawn, you might also then want to see if you want to see how many you can fit in. Say he's got this Encyclopedia Britannica, and you think, well, how many are going to fit on that shelf? You can copy move next to itself, and then you can hit times, well, let's just guess 20. Now you can fit more on, so try again times 25 times 30. Yeah, you could fit you could fit about 30 on there. So very helpful tool, helps you lay stuff out, really impresses customers. And if you would like to go download that, that would be very much appreciated. Um, gives me something, gives you something, and helps me to keep making these videos. I have decided not to put these videos behind a paywall. Um, I want to make them accessible to as many people as I can. I want to help you grow your business. Um, and this is a way that I can hopefully just get a small payback for my time. Okay, well, thanks very much for watching. I will continue this series. I'm very open <clears throat> to your feedback about what you would find helpful. And I covered groups and components partly because I got the feedback that um, that's something someone wanted to understand better. 
So do tell me what I can do better, um, what would help you, and that will feed into the next videos. Thanks very much for watching.